Triple negative. So how long? You're the expert. I'm not, obviously. But guesstimation. Is there a timetable as to how long it takes for it to grow? So I don't. I can't necessarily give you a time. I may have to defer to. Like, so once you have like a once once you have symptoms, okay, like a lump or something like that, mm -hmm. has it been sitting there for? years months or it well it would depend on what what stage you're in so it so obviously with a lot of cancers the earlier you are diagnosed the better your outcome is i'm going to defer to my clinician so oh sorry i'll switch then yeah <laughs> um a lot of it does depend so just focusing on triple negative we do tend to think as dr singh ben mentioned that that's more aggressive a lot of fa risk factors go into how aggressive something is, some of which I'll cover, but some of it has to do with age, but then also the subtype. Um, so if you think at the converse, there are slower growing cancers, which actually in older women could have technically been there for years. But when you think of these triple negatives, they can grow quite quickly, and I think months is a good answer to that. That is sobering, isn't it, uh, to hear that? Any more questions? You gotta have questions. Don't be shy. This is the moment to ask. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask something that I, uh, when I talk to my, you know, gal pals, and we talk about these kinds of things. Something like if somebody has, uh, you know, sore. A couple kids here, but we'll say it. Like a sore, you know, the the top of your breast. Okay, the nipple area. If that's sore, um, and it's all of a sudden, and it's just like this pain that. You know, they're not wearing any tight clothing or anything like that. But you have, a, you know, a symptom like that. Could that be a sign of something that should be checked on? Is that one of the symptoms for breast cancer? Or like even if they don't find a lump? I think if you see or feel anything, always just get evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called inflammatory breast cancer, which I won't go as much into. But it, is, it does more manifest with skin um, changes. And that's part of how you diagnose it, is if someone is having a rash that is coming quickly within the, you know, about three months, covering about a third of the breast. So I think any time you have a question about breast health, it's good to just have, get it checked out by a physician. So here's my point to all of you here. And we have all kinds of ages and genders here. Don't be scared to stop what you're doing and just get it checked out. And you know what? If you don't have the money, go ask somebody. Somebody that you know in your family, your cousin, whatever, say, hey, I'm going to get this checked out. I bet you a buck that because of what that sensitive issue is, that they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to spot you. I'm going to give you. Because who does, you know what I mean? To help you out and just get it checked out. Even if it sounds embarrassing, and I say this coming from a minority, sometimes within the minority, and I'm, of course, Latina, you know, I no kid, I don't want to talk about that because it's your private. Zone. You, it's 2019. Okay, talk about it. And I love the fact that you're recording this, Charles, because God only knows how many lives we're, you're going to be able to save by putting out all this information that the two of you are talking about. Okay, so this is now bringing you back into the mix and do the proper introduction, right? And now, uh, behold, we've got back on the podium this time, Dr. Raymond. B. Mailhot, did I say your name correctly there? Um, Mayo, like Cinco de Mayo. Mayo, I wasn't even close. Raymond B. Mayo, wow, okay, well now, note to self, right? Um, thank you all very much for having me. At first, uh, when I got the invitation, I was worried I couldn't make it because I live in Jacksonville, in Duval County, but I'm actually here for uh, my best friend's wedding and I saw the henna on Dr. Singh Ben's uh, hands, and so I'm actually in charge of the Singhi later tonight. So um, things actually worked out perfectly to be able to be here, not only for the wedding, but also for this event. Um, I actually sit on, uh, the, so the, I'm a radiation oncologist, and I'll go in further into what radiation oncology is. Um, we're governed by the American Society for Radiation Oncology, and I'm actually on the National Committee for uh, uh, health equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, you know, a lot of Latin people have two last names, and so legally, I'm just Mayo, but uh, my family's from Honduras, so it's Mayo Vega. Um, and so I think, you know, just in terms of representation, it is important, you know, particularly working at a public hospital in Jacksonville, a lot of my patients are black and brown, and there are disparities that we've only just really touched the surface of that exist for a number of reasons, some of which are biologic, but a lot of which are infrastructural. 
Um, so as much as I can do to shed light on what breast cancer is as a physician, I'm glad to be here today. I think what can be hard is when questions come to wait till the end. So I'm comfortable if y'all are, if anything, just if I say anything confusing, please stop me. If you have any question about something that I'm actually addressing, just shout. Because it might be easier to, to, do, to do it in the moment than wait for me to get there. Um, you know, if you ever hear someone talking, make sure that they're not connected to any type of pharma or that they have any financial incentive and have nothing to report. So we're going to go over uh, three main things today. Uh, I might reach for the, my water at some point because I'm also kind of getting over a cold. Uh, but we're going to go over cancer vocabulary, uh, the treatment types, and then what you can do as a patient. So being di diagnosed with cancer is not only just a health uh, obstacle, but it, it's very, um, you lose a lot of power, you lose control. And some of that, uh, unfortunately, is just the vocabulary and all these things that shouldn't be on your shoulders as a patient that you are now having to become an expert in. You know, I've spent 13 years of my life going through med school, residency, masters, to be able to do it, and in a 30 minute or an hour consultation, to expect someone to be on that same level isn't really fair. And so coming with the diagnosis, there is a loss of control, not understanding you know, the order of how things go in terms of surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, what the words are being told to you if you hear like grade two invasive ductal carcinoma, that's HER2 positive. That's a lot to digest, just in addition to the fact that you yourself heard the word cancer. And before I get, one other thing that I want to cover is while uh, breast cancer is very, very common in women, um, men do occasionally get it. So also, if you are a man and you ever notice any changes in your breast, we have breasts, we just typically, when a man call it our chest, that's also something that you can get evaluated by uh, a physician. So the four main words we're going to cover right now are just histology, stage, which we've already used, um, grade, and then subtype, which we've referenced as well. Um, so Dr. Til Tillman mentioned that uh, not all breast cancers are similar, that it's, it's a general word just in meaning referring to the breast itself. And to get at that, there's this idea of histology, and so what type of cells. So the breast itself is made up of different things. You have your ducts, you have the lo uh, lobules that are actually making milk, and you can theoretically or technically have cancer of any part of that breast unit. Um, most commonly, it is of the ducts, and that's part of the diagnosis if someone ever hears those words. Um, what's more... Uh, confusing can be the idea of stage and all that stage means is where the cancer has gone and so we typically think of uh, how big the tumor is and the lymph nodes although we will see that uh, in the most recent editions of how we do staging it in does involve or it, it, it does incorporate how it looks like under the microscope and then what subtype it is but at its simplest, it just means how far has it gone and it also relates to the actual prognosis of how aggressive it is and so, in addition to the breast, tumors tend to follow these lymphatic pathways, which are like uh, the trash receptacles of our body, just draining the dead cells. Um, and the breast has about four main regions. Um, there are internal, I'm gonna walk over this side. In the middle of the breast, there's the internal mammary nodes. And commonly, if you ever have a breast exam, the physician might feel under the armpit area, the medical word is the axilla. Um, that's because the, uh, the the lymph nodes can also drain that way. And then finally, we have the area that connects the back of the armpit area up to the neck, which is called the supraclavicular nodes. So a comprehensive breast exam will evaluate not only just the breast, but also those lymph node areas as well. Um, and so this is just another diagram of the anatomy of the chest and the different lymph node pathways. And so we've already heard the word stage four, and staging and treatment in general is very cancer dependent, because a lot of times patients will say, oh, I had a relative or a friend who had perhaps lung cancer or a certain other type of cancer. But, and I think while in some instances it can be helpful to compare uh, what other people have gone through, but with breast cancer in terms of certain aspects of it, the stage might reflect something different from another cancer in particular. And the chemotherapy regimens will be different, and in particular the radiation re regimen will be different as well. For breast cancer, to be specific, stage four indicates metastatic disease. What metastatic disease means is that when we went over the, the, there can be tumor in the breast and the lymph nodes, metastatic disease means that it's gone somewhere else. It's gone past the lymph nodes. And most commonly when we think of breast cancer, those organs can be the brain, the lung, the liver, and the bone. 
And other words that might be, you know, when a physician is talking about st stage four cancer, is they might start using the word palliative treatment rather than cur cur curative. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the difference of those, of those two aspects. Um, curative treatment means that the cancer for someone can just be t completely taken away. And traditionally, stage four cancer is a cancer because it's spread somewhere else where that's no longer a, a realistic goal. Because it's gone to these other places, it's not yet medically feasible, although there are advances towards it, to, to eradicate the disease everywhere within the body. Because for some reason, it's been able to spread from the breast and the lymph nodes to somewhere where it shouldn't be, like the bone or the liver. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, the prognosis is necessarily months or weeks. Because I think, you know, traditionally, if we look at TV shows and someone is diagnosed with metastatic disease, we think that that means that the, the, the life expectancy is quite short. But breast cancer is very varied. You know, one out of eight women will be diagnosed, and that means that there's a large spectrum of what that can look like. And so, particularly if we think of uh, less aggressive cancers in older women that are positive for the estrogen and progesterone, um, people can live years, even decades, with uh, metastatic cancer. And then the idea of palliative means that even though a, 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 uh, the intent might not be curative, it's really focused on a patient's quality of life. Um, people come in all shapes and sizes. People might have heart disease, uh, kidney disease on dialysis, and the idea of going through chemotherapy and balancing how aggressive do I want to be, because chemotherapy, as I've heard, you know, is debilitating. Treatments aren't there's always a price to it. Unfortunately, you know, as we're getting better with targeted therapies, there are less side effects. But it's really a balance of trying to figure out what is best for someone. So the grade I mentioned a little bit, but what all that means is, if a physician is talking to you about that, um, how does it look like under a microscope? Um, it's, it's a scale of three, one, two, or three. Three meaning it looks the most abnormal or least like healthy cells. One meaning it's... Uh, the least abnormal or m more similar to healthy cells. And then finally, subtype, which we've referenced a couple times, which triple negative is representative of. So what subtype represents is the fact that there are three categories that when a biopsy is done or, or breast cancer tissue is ever analyzed, there are three different things that are being evaluated. Um, while breast cancer does affect men, it is much more common in women. And we did discuss the idea that estrogen, which is a female, um, uh, hormone is somewhat related to it. And so <clears throat> we do test for three different things, um, one of them being estrogen, um, progesterone, which is another female associated hormone, typically more with childbirth. And then another, um, not hormone, but something that the cells actually express, which is called HER2. And so you have three different categories that are actually being tested that determine a subtype. The idea of does it express estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, or HER2. And the fact that you have those three and can break them down reflects the four different subtypes. Um, basically meaning that something can be estrogen receptor positive if it's, neg not, if it's negative for HER2. If it's positive for HER2 and negative for estrogen receptor, it's just HER2 positive. If it's negative for everything, that's what we call triple negative. And if it's positive for both, it's called triple positive. Um, triple negative is uh, an aggressive variant. Um, you know, there's only about 10% of people diagnosed will have triple negative cancer, but it is more common in the black population. Um, and just as a vocab check, again, triple negative meant that it didn't express the three different receptor types that we were discussing. So it's higher than 10%. Um, it's Sorry, could you repeat that? So she asked, uh, what is the percent of uh, triple negative disease in the African American community? I think, uh, I think it's about uh, 20%. It's definitely not the majority. I think the majority of cancers for any race or ethnic group is still going to be the estrogen receptor ERPR positive, but it is more common than in the reference population. Any other questions? And so treatment is really guided by a combination of all of those three things. What type of cells it was, which that's what the word histology means, the subtype. Is it triple negative? Is it hormone receptor positive? The hormones, again, being estrogen and progesterone. And then what stage is it? And it's that combination that will guide the treatment of the care team. 
And so there's three main types of treatment. Um, there's, but even further back, there's just two different types, local and systemic. And what that means is, does the medication or treatment target the entire body, which systemic does, just in the idea that chemotherapy or hormones are a pill, just like Advil, just like antibiotics, and that it goes out and through in the entire body. Specifically meaning that because it's doing that, you can have side effects in other parts of the body than what's being treated. You know, many times you might hear that women lose hair during chemotherapy. And that's, that might seem odd because if the goal is to treat the breast and the lymph nodes, why is there hair loss? Um, but that's simply because the medication is going throughout the entire body. Whereas uh, local treatments are surgery and radiation. And surgery is something that's very intelligible. You know, you might have had your wisdom teeth removed or might have had a broken bone. And the idea of it meaning local just refers to the fact that, let's say someone had surgery on their knee, you wouldn't expect their elbow to hurt the next day because what the surgeon was doing was focusing on the knee. And something that I, particularly as a radiation oncologist, I'm going to go over today is radiation is also a local treatment. So it's also targeted. It's not the whole body that's being treated. And I think out of the three different types of treatments, if we think of systemic radiation and surgery, Radiation tends to be the most mysterious, you know, it's the less com least common one that people see day to day. So I'm going to spend a little time on that. <clears throat> so um, not all surgeries are the same. And uh, we had heard about mastectomy earlier, but depending upon the stage or depending upon what in what's involved, uh, a woman may also be able to have a lumpectomy. And so what that simply refers to is a mastectomy means that the entire breast is removed surgically, uh, surgically while a lumpectomy just means uh, part of the breast where the tumor is. Earlier we talked about that breast anatomy means that the lymph nodes can be involved. And so in many types of surgeries, uh, the lymph nodes have to be evaluated. And that's even true if, let's say, a mammogram or some type of other imaging uh, shows that the lymph nodes look negative. Even in surgery, they'll still typically look at the lymph nodes themselves. Um, but there are different ways of doing that. You can look at only a couple and try to see where the breast is... Uh, because the breast will typically drain to one lymph node. You can try to find that one. Or in more advanced cases, um, they'll actually remove all the lymph nodes. And we heard the idea of 32. And typically when we hear of a lot of lymph nodes, that's because all the um, lymph nodes under the armpit area or the axilla have been removed. And then not to forget about the last type of surgery is the idea of reconstruction. So if a woman has a mastectomy, it's completely her choice with what she wants to do. Um, afterwards, you know, some women may not opt for reconstruction, but that is an option that always exists, um, or at least is, is an op option that should be discussed with your physician, um, be it uh, having an expander or an implant, there are different prosthetics if someone wants to avoid further surgery, or even using part of the, uh, a woman's own tissue as a, as a means to actually create a, a, a reconstructed breast. Um, with systemic therapy, it's, I mentioned this kind of bucket earlier, but to go further in depth, there's different types of, when we think about chemotherapy and endocrine therapy are the most common. And on the next slide, I'll go a little further into it, where um, if we know that estrogen and progesterone are hormones, um, then we actually have hormone therapy that women with that type of cancer will actually be recommended. And treatment with hormone therapy can actually last for five to ten years. Um, if, some, if someone has a type of tumor that's HER2 positive, which we talked was that third option, that third subtype, um, there's targeted therapy that actually goes for those cells that express that HER2 itself, um, which is different from chemotherapy because chemotherapy is affecting all the cells within the body, and that's why someone might be having, let's say, hair loss related to it, whereas the targeted therapy for HER2 is really only a t affecting those cells that are expressing that HER2. When we look at chemotherapy, that's usually recommended for women with lymph node positive disease, as well as those with HER2 positive disease and triple negative disease. However, some women may not be recommended it, and in those instances, age usually will play a role. Um, and in the way that systemic therapy is given, apart from hormone therapy, which is a daily treatment, um, it usually happens in cycles. And we heard the idea of, you know, three days a week, or it usually happens, you know, uh, a certain amount of days a week, but every two weeks, every three weeks, or four weeks, depending upon the regimen. And then finally, uh, radiation therapy. So these machines, I, I not only treat women with breast cancer, I also treat children. Um, but I honestly think when I talk to the kids that they do look like spaceships, especially that one. 
Um, and it is something foreign, you know, it's not something when we go to the doctor that we normally see a machine like this. But the important thing about radiation, again, is that it's targeted. You know, this is very imposing, and if, you're, if you are on being treated, it can be very... Um, that first experience, again, is this idea of losing control or ha undergoing something that you didn't necessarily sign up for. Um, however, but the important things I want to talk about in terms of the myths associated with radiation is that um, it's targeted. Um, so that means that it's not the whole body that's being treated. It's, it'll either be typically part of the breast, um, the whole breast, and it can involve the lymph nodes. Um, if a woman has a lumpectomy, and that's what the former side was saying, is that um, if they've done studies that shown if a woman has a lumpectomy, there's actually improved survival rates if she receives radiation afterwards. So it's typically recommended um, in non-stage four settings for women with lumpectomy and or lymph node positive disease. Um, you know, sometimes patients will ask me, does radiation make me radioactive? Do I have to avoid being uh, around family or my children? And that's absolutely not true. Uh, radiation, uh, the sessions are daily. They usually last an hour, 30 minutes to an hour, but the machine is actually only on for about five minutes. If we're trying to be so targeted, if it's a therapy that's similar to surgery, most amount of that time is making sure that patients are in the right position so that you're actually targeting the area you want to treat and avoiding the area you don't want to. And so I just took a representative slice right here, and what we're looking at is someone's left breast being treated. Um, so we're looking at the CT slice, looking at it this way, so to orient ourselves. This is the breastbone, this is the back of the spine, uh, that's the heart. That's the left lung, right lung, uh, right breast, and left breast. And so you can see that what all we're trying to really target right here is the left breast. Um, in terms of what our current advances in uh, breast cancer, there's a lot. Is there enough? No. But uh, what is something that's, that might be discussed or that you might hear on the news? Um, one of them is the idea of immunotherapy, and part of that is just the fact that, um, uh, you know, these pharma companies can do direct-to-consumer ads, and you might hear of ads called, like, like uh, drugs called Opdivo. Um, and immunotherapy has been a huge change for cancer management, but not necessarily all cancers. So we've seen great advances in, um, you know, melanoma, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, and that is what's really changing our idea of can we actually cure stage four patients. Um, and what immunotherapy actually does is scientists have actually realized that the immune system does play a role in how cancer develops. Our, in, our, our immune system actually does look for cancer cells, cells that are growing abnormally and actually eradicates them. And what immunotherapy does is sometimes for, for a cell to become malignant or cancerous, it actually escapes being caught by our immune system. And so what immunotherapy does is give up, gives our immune system a boost to be able to, to detect it. Um, so I'm a radiation oncologist again, and so something within radiation that's an advance is this idea of proton therapy. And so if we, um, all that radiation is for medical treatment is x-rays. You know, if you've ever had an x-ray or a CT, that's the same type of treatment that uh, radiation is for breast cancer in 99% of centers. It's just high energy x-rays or, you know, photons. Um, but that typically goes in a line, meaning that even if we're trying to treat a target, it can still go past it um, because it, tra it travels in a line, which is different from charged particles or what an example would be proton therapy. So any charged particle when it travels only goes a certain distance and then it'll stop. And so if we're looking at both of these ideas of uh, orienting ourselves again, this being the breastbone, the left breast, and the heart, you can actually reduce the heart dose with this type of treatment by still treating the breast the same in both cases, being, but leaving the heart um, better spared with this type of treatment. So the most important part of this is this slide, honestly. Um, if you feel something, say something. Uh, a lot of times, you know, women might uh, have other, and I'm saying women even though this affects men, um, but life can get in the way, you know, having kids, having a job. Uh, but if you do feel something, it's important to get evaluated. And the idea of, I think bullet point two is, is very important, is find doctors you trust. 
you know, I've spent 13 years just in the training aspect of this. Um, but the important thing after you ever leave an encounter is do you understand what's happening and do you trust that, that's, that the best is being done for you? And so that's an option that exists is that that first person you meet may not be the one who clicks for you. Um, and so make sure that for that person who is going on this journey with you, which is very emotional, which is very scary, that you find the people along that care path that you trust. Always advocate for yourself. Um, we are all humans. Um, if you're experiencing something, if you have a side effect, uh, you're not costing anyone's time by just expressing that. If you need to be explained something because it hasn't been made clear, that's the physician's job, that's the care team's job to make sure that, is it intel that it is intelligible. So always advocate for yourself. And then finally, um, screening. And so uh, we've all heard about mammograms, which are just x-rays that are uh, used to evaluate the breast. And here's where it is a little confusing. So there's all these acronyms right here, and those just represent different doctor groups, you know, either be it uh, OB, like, um, like gynecologists, surgeons, uh, uh, the chemotherapy doctors, um, and then the United States uh, Preventative Service Task Force. And they all have different recommendations for how and when and how often uh, women should receive mammographic screening. At the end of the day, um, you know, the earliest that is recommended is 40, with the most frequent being annually. Um, but at the most minimalist end, um, at least 50 to 74 every two years. And so if you definitely fall out of this, uh, you know, if you're within the ages of 50 or 74 and haven't received a mammogram in two years, uh, it's time to, to ask your doctor uh, to get checked. And here are, are resources. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet and there's a lot of message boards and all the information you find might not actually be correct, but these are ones that I would recommend in the sense that it has been vetted by experts or physicians um, and that the information that they present is fair and accurate for, uh, for breast cancer. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Wow, wow, wow. That is powerful. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Increíble. Gracias. Stunning, right? So much information just coming at us. This has been, oh, Charles is on the phone. He's, you know, he's always in talking with everyone. No, someone's trying to find the room. Oh, try, someone's trying to find the room. The tables are filling up little by little, right? Oh, there's a question. Okay, what's your question? Let's see. At what point do they need to, how will they know to be screened? Is there any particular symptoms that they need to look for, anything that happens? So this is, a, again, another time where it's good to go over vocabulary, because there's a difference between um, screening mammograms and diagnostic mammograms. So screening mammograms are meant for women who have no symptoms, because that's what, that's what you're trying to do. You're just screening. If someone has a, a lump, if someone has any type of symptom or abnormality that they're feeling or that has been felt by a physician, that's not a screening mammogram, that's called a diagnostic mammogram. So if you're below 40 or if you're actually any age and feel something in the breast, that's a different type of imaging and we're, not, we're no longer screening because we felt something or there's some indication. And so at that point, it might not just be a mammogram, it might involve an ultrasound or in some cases even an MRI. Which is what I had, by the way, the diagnosed the second time go around. They're like, ooh, we, you know, we want to just double check some. Any question? Any other questions? Hi. Um, years ago, you know, it was women over 40, women over 50 that would have mammograms. And of the people that I know that are under 40, um, they are contracting this estrogen based type of breast cancer. Do, do the researchers know? why it seems, for the people that I know, it seems to be increasing in our young population of women. Is it environmental or is it, I'm not sure how to. So um, what's interesting about this is that um, if we look at cancer globally and you look at countries that have lower resources, uh, breast cancer is not as common, and another female cancer that is, is cervical cancer. 
Um, but as countries actually have uh, higher GDPs or higher income or more resources, there's usually an inversion that um, cervical cancer rates usually go down and breast cancer rates go up. Now that's, um, what's hard to do with a study like that is say, this is the reason why, because you're, you're looking at kind of an evolution without being able to control for everything to really say, this is what caused that. But there's a lot of um, hypotheses for why that might be happening. Some of it is high fat diet. Um, some of it, and Dr. Tilgman, I think should, um, I would let her speak as well about those risk factors that she mentioned. So I'll just kind of give you one example. So there are lots of epidemiological studies which show that, so countries like Asia have lower incidence of breast cancer. Um, if they move here, um, the Asian family, their offspring ha actually have a higher um, risk of breast cancer. So you can look at it, 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 it may not be completely genetic, a lot of it is lifestyle factors. So when you know, we move to the Western diet, it's higher fat, it's lots of fast food, um, so things change dramatically. So again, we may not be able to pinpoint it to one thing, but it definitely is associated with um, lifestyle, lifestyle factors. We have another question. Hi, um, I have a question for you guys. Um, for people, or for women or male that don't have insurance, what are some of the ways that they can examine themselves, especially ladies with the bigger boobs? Sorry. <laughs> you know, because um, one, we're not being taught in school how to do breast exams. Um, so most of us don't know how to te teach our kids how to do it. And if we don't have insurance or because, you know, we speak a totally different language, we're coming from a different country, what are some of the resources that you guys can provide for us so we can say, you know what, definitely I need to search something out? You know. So I can talk a little bit about self-breast exams. Um, and the uh, American Cancer Society actually has, um, if you go online, they actually have like little pamphlets that you can look at to kind of, the things that you can hang in your shower or, you know, by your bed to show you how to do it. But it's basically your feeling to see if you feel any lumps. Now, obviously that may not be as comprehensive as going to the doctor, but that's actually how a lot of women detect uh, their own lumps, by just feeling themselves. I'm not sure about resources, because I'm more on the basic uh, science side, not on the clinical side. That's how Frances found out. She well, that's how Frances found out. Right. She, she felt, felt something. Right. Yeah. She felt so something. Okay. The, that's an excellent question, and clinically is a little controversial because they have actually done studies where they taught um, patients how to do clinical breast exams and then saw where, where malignant tumors detected more often. Um, and they weren't, but that, that also came with the cost of the women who were taught went more often in for biopsies, which subjected them to more, you know, to procedures that they didn't necessarily need. So uh, cl clinical breast exams are not necessarily recommended. If you ever feel something, though, always go to a physician. What's unfortunate is I, n I know resources in Duval County, but I'm not as familiar with um, here about uh, what, what exists, and I apologize for that. We have one more question here. I just want to make a comment, oh, oh, comment to what you asked about for the self breast exams. I know that the American Cancer Society has uh, programs that will train you how to do self uh, breast exams. And I know that the, um, the black doctor, black nurses rock, they do that. And also the national, uh, the black nurses association, they'll do that. But I just wanted to comment on Dr. Raymond. What he said, that some of the take home points, if you feel something, say something, find doctors you trust, advocate for yourself and screen. But more than anything is, uh, when you try to advocate for yourself, I would suggest that you reach out to advocates that can advocate for you. Because when you're going through the process, you don't know what to advocate for. And I know that there's, uh, through the American Cancer Society, I know that there's the Sisters Association, the Hispanic Associations, and you can have someone that can advocate you, can advocate for you, find resources for you, and there's advocates around that can help you, that can even go to the physician's um, visits with you or help you prepare to ask questions. So when you're ill or you're going through that, you don't hear 
when they say the word cancer or when they start talking about treatment, you don't hear that. So you, even if you have an advocate that goes to the appointment with you to just take notes for you, so you, so you can, they can say, well, what did he say? What did he say or what did she say? So I, just to uh, emphasize to find someone that can advocate with you and for you. No, that's an excellent point. And so I think that for these visits, um, an advocate can come in a lot of different varieties, you know. I think just family members, because uh, you're exactly correct that you're hearing a lot of information and the second that the word cancer comes out, are you, are you really in the best emotional state to really understand and hear everything? And it's not fair to expect that. So I always recommend patients to bring friends or family. Apart from that, you know, there are social workers. So the idea of how do I connect myself to resources or if I do need financial support, if you're at a physician's office, you can, or particularly in a cancer center, ask to be connected with a social worker. And then finally, the idea of an advocate through the process, um, usually that's called a nurse navigator. And so that's another type of advocate um, who can help someone throughout the process. Yeah, here I'm. I should have worn my sneakers today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how, if you find out that you have breast cancer, how, um, how many opinions do you really, like they always tell you, go get a second opinion, or, you know, your family members say, oh, go five times, go to five different doctors and find out. How, what is your recommendation? So if I go in or I test myself and I found a lump, what, you know, how many, what's, the, how, you know, opinions would I need to say, okay, this is what I need to do? Because sometimes you go to this doctor and they're telling you, oh, this is the treatment you need. And then you go to this one, oh, you don't need all of that. You just need this. So, you know, that, that type of, no, don't apologize. Um, I, I, I understand. I think that it's up to you. I think that it is possible that that first time, that first person you meet is someone you connect with and that you do trust and respect and perhaps you don't need a second opinion. Um, but uh, I would, and what I'm thinking right now is my mom who is the type of person to get five opinions. And so I think what you don't want to do is overwhelm yourself and then care is being delayed because so many opinions are being sought. And it's hard to put a limit because theoretically you might meet two people that don't connect with you. But I think that um, it, it's really up to you and have you found that connection that you need to get through this. And also follow your gut, right? I think we all have that gut feeling like, you know what, I feel like I need to get a second opinion or also take into consideration um, what he just said, what, what, you know, what Dr. Raymond said, which is if you, it, you could delay your treatment if you're going to ask around so many different folks to see which is the best treatment for you. Okay, oh, yes, here I come. I need to stay back here for a little bit. Getting my steps in. With Frances's situation, she did have the first doctor at Sylvester. She didn't feel like the doctor was following her care properly. She did follow up with another doctor within the system. And then at that point when she felt like she wasn't getting what she ne needed, then she left and went to Moffitt. So no, you can... Well, she started chemo in August, and then Moffitt was in April. So this whole process was a year and three months for Frances when she was diagnosed that first biopsy until, until September of this year. It was about a year and three. So it was a very aggressive, very aggressive uh, cancer that she had, the triple negative. So in looking at that process, that's why I'm saying things need to be sped up. Because when we started to look at clinical trials, when we noticed that whatever chemo she was having was growing the tumor and not helping it decrease, that's where she was like, okay, what do we need to do here? And that's why she was on the phone with me, because you know, having a medical background as well, we were looking at various things, but the clinical researchers were not getting anything to her fast enough, and we were just kind of running out of time. Time is of, was of the essence. I mean, it just seems like so fast. A year and a couple months is just so fast. So, 
So, uh, yeah, Charles had asked, is the fact that it grew so quickly common? And I think what's hard is we can talk about percentages, but that doesn't mean the individual level. So if we said something might happen 1% of the time, if you're that one out of 100, that's not helpful. Um, but to, to answer your question, is what we've heard about the story of how aggressive it is, is that common in the sense, is that what usually happens? I would say clinically, no. Thank you all. Those are uh, really powerful questions. And the, the insight the two of you guys have brought, Charles, to book them to be here today. Whoa, that is big time. One more question. And now it's 6 p.m. No, I'm just kidding. It's getting dark. Hang on. Oh, my steps, I know. Uh, I'm sorry, I have another question. Because you mentioned, that I've been told that I have dense breasts. That's why I'm curious about the density. Um, what is the risk factor with breast cancer when you have this dense, more dense breasts? So, so that idea is twofold. Um, one, dense breasts are harder to be, uh, it's harder to actually look at them if you're a radiologist to detect if something's there. And so that's why as part of the screening, um, if you have a screening mammogram and it's some, uh, a result might say the um, too dense of breasts, or particularly in, in younger women, that's why sometimes these other imaging choices might happen, you know, either an MRI or an ultrasound, apart from just being a risk factor itself. So it's the idea that not only could it be a risk factor, but it could just be harder to detect. Thank you. And you know what? Now that, just to piggyback on your question, line of questioning about dense breasts, does it matter if you have big boobs or small boobs? I'm just going to ask that. Because when I, when I went from my thing, I was like, but these are very small, doctor. What's the problem? And he's like, well... Well, I know what he told me, but why don't you... The size doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't know of any evidence that says, mm -hmm. like... I mean, so if we were to take a step back, it would seem logical that if you just had more breast tissue, you'd be at a higher risk. But I'm not aware of anything. Mm -hmm. It can be... Um, just make sure that if you have... If you're more well endowed, that you are yourself feeling like you're undergoing a thorough uh, medical exam. Because there is more breast tissue that does need to be evaluated. Just mm -hmm. gotta put it out there, gonna keep it real. Do you know what I mean? Because that's the question that we all giggle at. But it's like, wait, no, we have to ask that. Uh, I'm very impressed by the two of you. I've learned so much today, haven't you? Yeah. Oh my gosh.